Hi, this is Robert Raymond Riopel. I am the author of the international best-selling book, Success Left a Clue. And on my episode of the Business Growth Architect Show, I'm going to share with you exactly how I was able to actually get started in business with no money, as well as being able to show you ways to get unstuck, even if you think you don't know your passion. So I look forward to you joining us so that you can get those tips. Hello, fabulous person, Beate Shaletti here, The Growth Architect. Welcome back to the Business Growth Architect Show, where we bring you cutting-edge business strategies from some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, business transformation experts, and visionaries who want to help you to scale your impact. Look for one tangible strategy that you can take back and implement right away. And now back to our guest. Hello, fabulous people. This is Beata Chalet, the Growth Architect, and welcome to another episode of the Business Growth Architect Show. Today, I am live on air with a good friend, a colleague, and his name is Robert Raymond Riopel. And we are going to have some fun. We're going to talk knowing him about mindset and a lot about strategies. And you're going to find out why people like Harv Eker think he is the real deal. Robert, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you. Well, thank you. And thank you for putting the pressure on me that we actually have to have fun. What am I going to do now? <laughs> I, I, I know. I can see the sweat piling up on your forehead. So, uh, Robert, tell the audience who may or may not know you and may or may not be familiar with what you've done before, what should they know about you? Who are you? Well, I'm a goofball. That's one of the things to know about me. <laughs> I like to have fun because I believe there's way too many serious people on the planet and life's too short not to have fun. You know, put that aside, I am a serial entrepreneur, blessed to be a best-selling international author, um, app designer, and I've been, I've traveled around the world and personally taught over half a million students in live trainings, anywhere from three to five days long at a time, 100 to 6,000 students at a time, you know, just living what my passion and doing what I love, impacting lives. And 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 he says this like it's like nothing between a hundred and six thousand people at a time. Let's talk a little bit about strategy. So you and I, we've been in a mastermind together, and we've talked about some of the strategies that you use around speaking and getting on stages because that's you know that's where that's how we met. But I want to start taking a look into what strategy is in your life and in your business? And is it the same or are those two different things? Hmm. Wow, that's a great question. Because the first thing that comes to my mind when you say, what is a strategy? To me, a strategy is a system. And if something that's already worked, been proven, and that you put it in place and then you follow the steps. And I come to that because you know, one of my previous lives, over 20 years ago, I was a Domino's Pizza franchisee. And everything was about systems, and that was our strategy. And, and at the end of my nine years of being a franchisee, one of the things my wife and I did that really um, blew people away is we'd go into stores that were bankrupt or about to go bankrupt, and within three months, we could be walking out of the store with sales and profits going up by over 100%. And people were going, how the heck did you do that? What was your strategy? And we looked at them and said, well, we actually just went in and cut out all the crap that was not the Domino's pizza system. Because one of the things that Domino's love to tell people is, hey, the average age of a Domino's pizza franchisee is 23 years of age. And that's how old my wife and I, when we became franchisees um, at the beginning, that they love to tell people about that. But what they didn't tell people is that the average new franchisee went bankrupt within six months of becoming a franchisee. And the reason was is because they'd go in and they go, I'm not a manager anymore. I now own the store. I'll do it my way. And they start changing the strategy, changing the systems. And then they'd wonder why they go under. And so we'd come in, look like rock stars, because we'd go in and go, cut this out, cut this out, cut this out. Customer service is number one. This is how we do the pizzas. This is how we do this. We retrain the staff and look like rock stars walking out of the store because the sales and profits are going up. So that's kind of what I look at as strategy. And on the second part of your question, to me, Strategy and life and business, to me, I don't see much difference. That's the reason I asked you that question, because I had a, I had a suspicion. And I think it's important that we point this out. And I, I never even asked this question before. I, and I don't know why I was compelled to ask you that question. But I believe that, that when we step into really owning who we are and, and what we're good at, that that what we do and who we are kind of starts to intermingle. I've never understood, Robert, when somebody says, oh, I'm just like that at work. 
at home I'm oh. a completely di- <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Same, same thing. It's like, how is it even possible? So which of these like strategies? So let's let's take our listener to uh, through a couple of those because you are very big in the mindset, in the motivational s- space. You do a ton of speaking engagements, but you're also very tactical in some of the work that you do. So can you give the listener just a little bit of an overview sort of of the strategies that you've been involved with so we get the full picture? Because I don't want them to think that just you that you're just this one thing because you're not, you're many things. Well, first of all, I would say it's a strategy. Quit trying to do things on your own. That, how many people think they have to do it all? And then, so surround yourself with amazing people, right? I'm glad you raised your hand because, hey, this is a battle I fight with as well. And so the first strategy I now put into any new business, any new thing I'm going forward with is, who can I have fun with? to make this strategy so it's not as stressful on me, we can make it fun and we can all share in the success of it. And, you know, from our previous conversation before we actually started the show, one of the things that came to my mind is, you know, something that people very seldom ask me is they go, because if you look at my story, my wife and I went from being managers to franchisees and we did it without having any money. And people go, because we didn't just buy one store, we bought two stores and we did it with no money of our own. And people go, okay, how the heck did you do that? And it was a strategy we didn't realize was a strategy back then. But my mindset was you can't, you know, buy a business if you don't have money. You can't start a business if you have no money because I didn't understand that. I didn't know what I didn't know. So back then that was my mindset. And thank goodness my wife, you know, youngest of five raised by a single mother, her whole strategy in life is you find a way if it's something you truly want, you find a way to do it. And we made a lot of mistakes. So another kind of, guess, strategy, be willing to make mistakes and learn from them. Because some of your greatest mistakes give you your greatest lessons. And we spent about five months making a lot of mistakes, but we learned until we had the confidence when we knew what to say and what not to, to our bank. And they ended up giving us 100% financing for both stores. And people go, well, how did you even get in that position? Well, the strategy we actually used to allow us to even have that is we created a management agreement with our franchisee. He wanted out of Domino's Pizza so bad, he didn't want to be responsible for stores anymore. He didn't want to be responsible for any debt that was being created. So we signed a management agreement, and from the day we signed it, it didn't matter how long, we like we gave it, I think, something like five or six months where we had to be able to buy the business or it went back to him. But from the moment we signed the management agreement, we were responsible for all losses or profits that that store produced. He was totally off the hook. And so because of that, we are now getting the experience, which then allowed us when we went to our bank finally four months later, now with confidence, we were already say, able to say, hey, for the last four months, we've already been running this business. Here's what our profits have been doing. You're the bank. You see them coming in. And we have enough assets in the company to actually justify because we got the price at a great price for the stores. So we have enough assets for you to secure the loan. They gave us 100% financing. And even all the overturn costs, like food on hand and stuff, we had made enough money running the store as the management agreement that we had that money in the bank to pay him when we did the exact, the actual turnover of the two stores. So that's a strategy that we used. (laughs) That's really genius. So, so it was almost like the figure it out while you're flying the plane kind of strategy is make Mm -hmm. the decision first and then figure it out. So I want to dive into that a little bit more because you are so big on mindset, Robert. So what would you say if, you know, when we tell the strategy to somebody that Robert did something he didn't know how to do, he kind of just decided he was going to do it. He didn't know what and how he didn't have the money and he did it anyway. So what would you say to people that say, that's not a strategy because don't you have to have the whole strategy step-by-step fully planned out in the three-year plan like everybody teaches you in business school no 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 no. he's laughing by the way for the (laughs) listeners who can't see he's just laughing (laughs) because hindsight being 2020 that was my mindset and and, but my wife again and and you know i'm going to set the context like this is that one of the many ways i'm blessed my wife and i met when we were 13 we started dating when we were 16 we got married when we were 19 And in a month and a half, we celebrate our 33rd wedding anniversary. 
And I would not be here talking to you and your audience today if it was not for her, because I was so taught the you figure you, you step by step, you don't be an entrepreneur. Even if you hate the job, you find the job that's going to make you the most secure and pay you the most money. That's how you take care of your family. And even if you hate it, that's what you do to take care of your family. So the only reason I fell into this is because my franchisee said, I'm selling the stores. And I knew the managers were let go right away because the new owners came in with their own team. And my wife was my assistant. So that meant both of us were about to lose our income. So my strategy, and I want people, don't think I'm brilliant. I'm not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Should please. I be talking to your wife? <laughs> I think so. And cause my, here was my whole solution. Here's my strategy. Well, there's eight other stores in the city. We need to go talk to those franchisees and find out who needs a new manager. And my wife looked at me and said, why would we do that? We're qualified to be franchisees. Why don't we just buy the stores? And I looked at her like she was insane. And I said, because we don't have any money. That's why we don't buy the stores. <laughs> and I probably was very condescending about it as well. But one of the greatest gifts she's given me is she's not willing to let me play smaller than I am. Oh. Even when it means holding my feet to the fire. And together, and you talk about the strategy in business to personal, together there's nothing we can't accomplish together. Now, it doesn't mean we're successful at everything. Hell no. We've crashed and burned in, in a number of different things. But one of our agreements is that we don't quit. And I had to learn that at a young age because she's like, no. You know, we, we went to someone who promised us a loan. They could find us an investor to give us a loan, but their upfront fee was $1,000 and we had to pay that. And the moment we did, all of a sudden, oh, I'm sorry, we have no one that is willing to take a chance on you guys. And I'm like, okay, what do, can we have a refund? Oh, no. And that, I wanted to stop. And she's like, no, we don't quit. What did we learn? And here's a great strategy. Three questions I'm always asking myself even today, whether it's something I do on my own or with a team. As soon as we're done, it's what worked. We take the emotion out of things. And it's just this, 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 this worked. Okay, what did not work? And it's not like, well, because of them. No, it's this didn't work. This didn't, no emotion, no blame, no just trying to put a negative energy to it. You just point of fact, this, 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 this didn't work. Okay, great. Now, what can we do different? And all of a sudden, you put yourself into that mindset of creativity. Well, we know if this didn't work, how could we do it a little different? And then you get back in the game. And if you use the analogy of ready, fire, aim, which I used to live by, no, nope, ready, or sorry, ready, aim, fire, is now ready, fire, aim, fire, aim, fire, aim. Because in business, especially, you could put all the things in place, like that three-year plan, and the moment you open your doors, everything can change. Because you, there's things that you can't plan. So you do what you can with the time you have, but then get in the game. Then adjust, fire again, adjust, fire again, adjust, fire again. And that's the biggest strategy I live by today. Yeah. And there's a couple of things I, I think we should point out as well. So number one, nobody in Silicon Valley goes past 18 months, period. There is no such thing when you work with companies that go for 10x that they would even think that they possibly, especially in technology, that they could predict what's happening in three years. That that's yeah. like that that's like <laughs> in the next century, basically. Yep. So 18 months is the most. The reality of this business plan, also important to point out for our listeners who are working on one right now, the only thing any bank ever wants to see is the numbers. They really, truly don't care about your marketing bonanza that you are sweating over for 40 pages, lining out exactly when you're posting, where you're posting, what you're saying, and the graphics you're using, and the brand colors. Nobody cares. The only thing a bank cares for is your numbers. Yep. So, so I like this idea. I think that that's really changed from back in the days when I wrote a business plan. I got funding by the SBA that was instrumental to me, you know, uh, refinancing my debt that got me on the radar and become an industry leader. And that's what attracted the Bill Gates company. And that's how I sold my business to Bill Gates. Today, I would do that very differently. Today, I would only write the numbers. I'd keep the business plan overview basically in a pitch deck format, you know, what, five pages, 10, 10 the most, and then uh, make it heavy on the numbers and do a lot of reframing, would not go further than 18 months out. 
for the bank, probably you do need to do three to five years out just because that's what banks are looking for. And they're generally not creative people or they don't have that uh, subject Latitude. matter. <laughs> Latitude or subject matter expertise even. Yes. Yeah. So, so we covered already a lot of ground. So my question now to you is what is your personal favorite strategy you want to share with the audience? Oh, I, I'm going to borrow from Richard Branson. And it's something you already kind of touched on. Say yes and figure it out. You know, if, if something comes up, and, and but I'm very selective. And it kind of goes back to you, you and I think we are, uh, I don't know if we're related, but we're definitely similar in so many ways. Because one of my biggest pet peeves, and I've been blessed to train thousands of trainers around the world. And I'll tell them right up front, my biggest pet peeve is someone who's one way on the stage. And the moment they step off the stage, they become someone else. You know, that that doesn't work for me. Be authentic, be who you are. So my favorite strategy is just, you know, if something feels right for me, that it's something I want to do, then I'm saying yes, and I'm, I'm going to give it 100%. And that's my whole thing is two words. All in is the strategy. That is very powerful. Say yes, and then figure it out. I think that's probably the number one thing entrepreneurs often miss that is misunderstood also what that actually means. It doesn't mean that you're running up and down the hallway and saying yes to every stupid idea no, somebody no. brings you. So, so shall we clarify this a little bit, Robert? Take it away. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's what I meant by it's got to be something that really resonates with me because I know I'm an all-in person and I've gone through the burnouts by overliving my passion. I've gone through the burnouts of doing more than without taking care of myself. So there's two questions I always ask myself. You know, Picture this, when I'm on stage in front of thousands of people, I get every latest, greatest, you know, Robert, you got to be part of this. You'll make millions doing this. And let me be clear. I haven't done things for money for years. I do things because it's something I'm passionate about and, and I can say yes to two questions. And if I say yes and I'm in, I'm all in, then money just comes. And as you and I talked about earlier, it becomes a beautiful side effect. You know, and in kind of a side thing, when I train a trainer, if they want me to mentor them, my number one rule with them the moment I sense you're doing this for the money, I will not mentor you anymore. I want you to do it because you're going to impact lives. I'll show you how to make the money. But if you're in it just because you want to make money, then we can't work together, plain and simple. And I hold that as a very firm you know, boundary of mine. And so when it comes to this, of, of the two questions, it's, is this in alignment with my mission? And so like my mission is to guide and assist individuals in identifying and living their purpose with passion. I, passion is my favorite word in the whole world. And if I get a no to that, I don't even go to the second question. I can easily say to the person, sorry, not interested. And I can rattle that question off of my head in a nanosecond now. Is this in alignment with my mission? And if, I, if it's a no, I just say, sorry, not interested. Knowing I have no control how they're going to react. And you know, because you've seen it a number of times, right? That people go, yeah, but, but, sorry, not interested. And I just, I don't get arrogant. I don't get ignorant. I say, it doesn't work for me. I don't have to give them an explanation. If I get a yes to that question, I go to the second question. Does this move me in the direction with my vision? And if it's a no, again, it could be yes to one, no to the other, not even looking at it. But if I get two yeses, now I will say, I will take a deeper look. And I eliminate over 95 plus percent of the opportunities just by asking those two simple questions. That's so powerful. What would you say to somebody says, I I'm, don't know. I don't, I don't, that sounds great, but I don't know what I'm passionate about. I don't know what my purpose is. Good for you, but that doesn't help me at all. What do we tell them? I, I just sim go through a simple little process and ask them a question of, oh, well, what is it you enjoy doing on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you make money or not? And, well, oh, I can't make money. That No, no, just what do you enjoy? Well, I like reading books. Great. What else do you enjoy? And by finding out what they enjoy, you can actually identify their passion. And it's not that they don't know what their passion is, in my experience, is they don't think they could actually make a living or do it in a way to make a living. So they discount it because they've heard things like starving artists. You know, I love playing the guitar, but you know, I don't want to be a starving artist. And so it's helping them identify that you do have insight into what your passion is. But also, I'm very, you know, if you look at my name, RRR, -R -R, Robert Raymond Riopel. The letters also stand for when I'm training, I keep things real. I'm going to tell you the good. I'm going to tell you the bad. I'm going to tell you the ugly. I don't have time to just give you the fluff. I'm going to keep it real, real with you. 
And what people don't realize is because their mind goes, well, I success, that's going to be a lot of hard work. You're absolutely right. You will have to put work into it. So wouldn't you rather put the work into something you're passionate about? Because here's a little clue for you. You're probably working harder right now, staying broken, miserable, than you'd actually have to work being successful and happy. <laughs> Right. So, <laughs> I so think this is the that? number one mind blowing sentence that I, I hear or the or the, the the paradox I cannot figure out. Why would you think that doing something you hate will bring you more money, more fulfillment and more of what you want than doing something that you love? I mean, that 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 that. I can't even put it in words on how idiotic that is. And yet half of the world does it because they think, and this is my assumption, because I I, I certainly don't live by that, that if I do something that makes me money, I can make myself like it, which to a certain degree I can accept. Okay, let's face it. You throw a million dollar at me for a deal and I'm kind of like, I was on the fence about it. Now I really like it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. But would I do something that very much like you, that is completely out of alignment, you know, and, and we're here to grow authority and scale impact. So if somebody comes in, they're only driven by money. That is a massive turnoff for me. Oh, huge. Because there is no, the, the vibration is differently and there is a different sense about it. And so here's my next question for you. And, and I don't want to let you go before we have shared some of your wisdom around mindset, because yeah. I know you are huge, huge on mindset. Care to share the principles, elements, steps, foundation? <laughs> I, I can't let you go unless I know. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that with my new book that I'm writing called The Authority Key, and another way you and I have a similarities, is I not only do I love to teach people the practical skills, but it's all about who are you as the person. Because one of the things I've seen around the world as I've traveled, people will do and work hard and work their butts off to get success, but then one little glitch and they self-sabotage and something takes them out. And so I'd rather people get that success and then maintain it. And so a, a great friend of mine, I nicknamed him years ago, called, I call him the quantum monk, because he actually <laughs> was, he was a monk for eight years, did over 15,000 hours of meditation in that time, but he also studies quantum physics, and, and his mind is brilliant, and he came up with something called the chaos modules, and I, I, when I first heard it, I'm like, this is powerful, but it wasn't his passion. He had discovered it and researched it while he was a monk and the, the science behind it and all that. And he put it together and he had taught it a couple of times, but it wasn't his passion. So I said to him, I said, Greg, I said, the world needs this. Do you mind if I help teach people this? And he said, Robert, please. And so we spent a lot of calls where I was digging in deeper with him. And it came to the point where all of a sudden he's like, damn, you've taken this deeper than I thought. And, you know, run with it now. And I call it the four phases of life. And what this is, it's a, you can call it a strategy if you want. And I like to keep things simple because mm -hmm. I tell people, Biate, I've got one brain cell left and I'm doing everything I can to take care of it <laughs> because, you know, I like simple. And so I put it into an acronym. And for the acronym, it is the acronym of the word open to take you through these, three, these four phases. The first one is called the observation phase. And what this is, is this is the time where you're not trying to be a human being or a human doing. You're actually a human creating. This is the time to actually give yourself space. And this is one of the things that most entrepreneurs do not do. They don't give themselves the space to ask themselves, what would I really love to accomplish? What, would I, what kind of life would I truly like to have? This is where meditation comes in. Vision boards are big. I'm huge on vision boards. And it's not about how am I going to create it. In this phase, you just, you have the vision and you write it down. You draw it. You put it on a piece of paper so you can see it. Visual is very memorable. In the observation phase, you take that time, you meditate, that's just to create. What would my ideal life look like? What would my ideal business look like? The P stands for the pamper phase. And this is the one that most entrepreneurs end up sabotaging themselves. You know the old saying, you can't give what you don't have? Well, how many times do entrepreneurs go, 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 and they forget to take care of themselves and wonder why they burn out? So in the pamper phase, this is about when you're in this phase, you plan a vacation or you go on a vacation. Maybe you get a massage. 
It doesn't even have to be that difficult. It could be, I take my phone, I have an app called Calm, and I'll set for the sound of rain. I love the sound of rain. It calms my mind. I put my earbuds in, and for 20 minutes, I'll just sit down and listen to the sound of rain, and it re-energizes me. So if I find a little headache coming on, I've been at my computer too long, something stressed me out, I'll just take 20 minutes. That's for me. And when I talk to entrepreneurs, one of the biggest things that hold them back is they're going, well, I'm burnt out. And so in the pamper phase, here's a strategy right here. I live by my calendar on my phone. Everything goes on that calendar. And when my wife and I sit down to do our calendars, the first thing we put on our calendar before anything else is our pamper pieces. Time for each other, time for family, time for ourselves, because this is most people don't give themselves time to just be with themselves. And so there's two words that come up when you're in this phase. One, creativity. You got to be creative of how you're going to pamper yourself. And two, be willing to be selfish. And I'll give you an example of that. BC, before COVID, I was on average flying, oh, good, you got my joke. Woo-hoo. I was on average flying over 200,000 miles around the world. And people go, well, Robert, why are you on these long haul trips where you're 10, 12, 14 hours on a plane? And I'm like, well, one, I love helping people in all these different cultures. But two, it is a selfish reason. The moment I sit in my seat, unless I'm traveling with my wife, the moment I sit in my seat, there's no business. I don't connect to the internet. I watch movies because I love movies. I read because I love to read. I eat good food and I drink great wine. Because I know the moment I'm off the stage the next three to, or off the plane, the next three to five days, I'm on stage up to 12 hours a day, giving, giving, giving. So if I don't recharge me, how am I going to properly serve my audience? So you've got to be creative in how you do it. And you've got to be willing to feel selfish to take time. And I guarantee you and your listeners, if you create some pamper space in your time, look at wealth rule number one, pay yourself first. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're doing that with money, why wouldn't you do that with your time? Plain and simple. Does I that make that. sense? Yes, it makes great sense. So we have two more letters left. Yep. E stands for the energy phase. This is the get her done phase. When you're in the energy <laughs> phase, this is where you're doing meetings, you're doing documents, you're doing emails. And this is why the pamper phase is even more important because when you're in the energy phase, and, and I'm going to guess you're about the same way as me, I can get in an energy phase where for 18 hours, I'm just pounding out work. Now, when I'm done that 18 hour day, am I tired? Yeah. But am I burnt out? No. And the biggest thing to understand in this phase as well, the biggest thing I hear from entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, well, Robert, you don't know my life. I'm so busy. I don't have time to do something else. Well, in my research, what I realized is, yeah, a lot of people are really good at being busy. They're not necessarily productive. productive. And so I, and I just instituted this with one of my students where she's got all these courses she's been trying to do and buying, but nothing's getting done. And I put her into 30 minute productive pieces. So the second thing that goes in my calendar after Pamper is I put in actual time slots where 30 minutes to an hour max for me, because I've learned that after an hour, I can't stay focused. I'm going to start getting distracted. So I will actually put in focused times. I'm, for this hour, I'm writing my book. And what I've realized is one hour of productivity for me, and it's just my equation that I've worked out, is actually equal to six hours of me being busy. So if you understand what I just said, I just freed up a ton of time for you. And it does take practice. I want people to understand that, to know that when, if I say for this 30 minutes, I'm doing nothing but, I set my timer, I'm focused on nothing else but that. And so what I get accomplished, and when that timer goes off, I stop. I don't do the, oh, just five minutes more. Nope, I stop. Because now I'm conditioning my mind that I have to instantly get focused when I go into a focus time. Because what do most people do? Okay, uh, I got an hour of productivity. Yeah, let me check. Let me check Facebook. Let me go uh, look at the news really quickly. Let me sharpen the pen. Let me get a tea. Let me go get coffee. Let me have a snack. Oh, 35 minutes. And I just fell in the TikTok vortex. And then, and then they sit there. And because they are so unfocused, that sometimes their brain just has to go and escape because it's such a prolonged period of time. I see this with my partner all the time where he goes, you know, he's working 18 hours and I know it's not working. And I know he's not working 18 hours. 
And then I catch him and he's like watching surf videos. And I'm going like, well, that's not being productive. You're sitting at your computer being busy, but you're not being productive. So I, I hear what you're saying. And so let's go to the letter N. Yeah. This one you have to get creative with me on because the N is not the first letter of the word. But to make it the acronym of open, I had to get creative. The last phase is called the unclutter phase. And so N is the second letter. And it's what other people might call chaos. And here's what happens for a lot of people. When they go into um, chaos, people resist chaos. They hate chaos coming into their life. But what I want people to understand is actually chaos is natural. And what that means is, as human beings, we're meant to evolve. And the reason chaos comes into our life is when we get stuck in our own ways, our own way of thinking, and we're not progressing, we're not evolving. And chaos comes in, gives us a little lesson. Now, of course, if we listen to the lesson, we get to move on. But if we don't, it doesn't go away, right? It comes back. Pressure increases. The pressure increases. So what I want people to understand is actually in the unclutter phase, the reason I call it unclutter is because you can actually volunteer for chaos. And what that means is, is you, when you're in this phase, you look at what can I unclutter in my life? Because in the chaos phase, this is the time to destroy something that is not working. Now, it might be a business or personal relationship. It might be destroying the, one of the biggest things for people to destroy, a belief that has not been supporting them, but they've been hanging on to it for so long, even though they know it doesn't support them, this is the time to let it go. And the way you do that is prove that belief to be wrong. Proof is a cure of all doubt. And so the way you really can volunteer for this is every two weeks, I'll, as an example, I'll come to my office and I'll just clean it up. I'll straighten around. I'll get rid of the papers I don't need anymore. I unclutter. Or you can go to your closet and straighten it up. Go to your refrigerator, straighten it up. So you're showing the universe that you're volunteering to unclutter your life so Mm -hmm. that there's space for the new things to come in. Because the moment you go through the unclutter, where do you think you go? Back to the observation phase. And yeah, I like that. What's the new possibilities, right? I, I like that a lot. I also refer to this part as the messy middle. I know that Bob Proctor referred to it as get comfortable being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. uh, perpetually. So the idea that that you are embarking on the journey of life to get to the part where you really step into what your purpose is or to live to your full potential that's not really something that a textbook was written on they certainly didn't teach you that in school you probably can't get an mba they didn't no i know it's a bummer uh there's no mba on that that is the school of life and that's uh, when the, the sooner in life that you figure out that concept of it is discomfort that creates the growth that leads to that next phase. And you lean into that, the more powerful the transformation will be. But does it ever end? No, it doesn't. You're constantly going around in the circle yeah. of those four phases. And that's why, you know, the my quantum monk, my favorite quote of his is he says this, he says, instead of being willing to live life, courageously allow life to live you. I love that. Because the biggest cosmic joke out there is thinking we have control. <laughs> and I think that's actually a great way for us to, to finish this interview, We even though I have so many more questions. But I like where we ended up on this because I do believe that the idea to say, yeah, mindset is one thing. And there are principles you can follow, but it is that it is the endless loop, the infinity sign that goes around everything that goes around life, that goes around your transformation, that goes around your, your perpetual growth. If you so choose to accept this mission in life to do that. And within that comes the beauty and the confidence and the empowerment of self and then of others. So just beautifully said. So for those of us who want to now listen to you speak and be one of the 100 to 6,000, or maybe even get a copy of uh, your current book or your next book, where would we go? Yeah, you know, one of the things I believe is that time is one of our most precious commodities. And so the fact that you took your valuable time to interview me, and even more importantly, that your audience took their valuable time to listen. You know, my first book, which is called Success Left a Clue, which is an international best-selling book, I've decided and what I love doing because I'm in my give back phase is this book here, it's a workbook. And meaning I know that people are creatures of habit. 
And one of the biggest things that I talk about in the book is a habit of action, consistent action. And so I wrote it as a workbook with action steps. And what I love for people to do is if they just go to robertreopel.com, just my name, R-O-B-E-R-T-R-I-O-P-E-L.com, they're actually going to be able to download the entire digital copy as our gift to them for taking their time to listen. And if they do that also, they're going to not only, and, and, and the caveat is they've got to not just download it, read it and do the action steps. Remember I said I'm a goofball? My book is written the same way. And there's even things in there where I'll go, hey, did you do the last action? If not, stop reading right now. Go back and do the action before you read any more. Because I know people are creatures of habit. And so I don't want them to just put it on the shelf. I want them to actually do it. If you do, you'll see how it'll change your life. And as because I am in my give back phase, is anybody who goes and downloads the book, they're also going to be able to book in a one-on-one with me, no one else, with me, strategy session where in 20 minutes they'll fill out a questionnaire before our call i'm just going to give them strategies to help them overcome things that maybe is blocking them stopping them hurdles to help them move whether it's in their personal life their business life whatever it is i don't do any selling on that call i'm just there to be of service and so i'd love to allow your audience to have that as well that is very generous and for those of you who take uh robert up on his offer which i hope you all do I will tell you this, that this is not a man that has a lot of time to give away. So if you have an opportunity to grab some of that and you are not clear about passion, purpose, or where where you need to move a few things in life to move forward, do take him up on the offer. And I'm sure that everybody will, when they sign up, also be notified when your next book is coming out, yes. which I, I, I will sign up, obviously, myself for. So that's it for us for today. Robert, it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you so much for so generously giving us your time and advice. Oh, thank you for having me. And that's it for today. This is Beata Chalet, the growth architect. And that's it for us today. Thank you for listening and watching the Business Growth Architect Show. I enjoyed having you here. And for accountability, just take one of the strategies that you have heard, one thing that you can implement in your business immediately. Please leave comments. Don't forget to like and share this show. And if you have any questions about business, please put them in the comments. We are here for you. We're here to support you and help you to grow, build, and scale your own business. For more advice, please check out our website in the show notes below. Thank you again. This is Beata Chalet, the Growth Architect, and goodbye.